Okay, guys, this is evolution two. Let's go ahead and get started on that. Okay. All right. Humans and other apes have a common ancestor around seven million years ago. Okay, and then the order, um, did we go over this at some point for you guys? Um, let's see if I can find a spot to raise it. There's domain, kingdom, Phylum class order family genus species. Um, we'll also talk about subspecies sometimes, so I'll include it. Um, <laughs> There's a mnemonic to help you remember these in order. It's did King Philip come over for good spaghetti? <laughs> There's others as well. This is just the one. That's just the one that always sticks in my head, probably because it's so random. All right. So for the order, um, humans belong to primates, the order of primates. Um, okay, the so binomial name of an organism gives its genus and species. So, for instance, humans are Homo sapiens. Um, the genus is capitalized, the species is not. That S probably looks capital. It's supposed to be lowercase. Um, so, like a wolf is canis lupus, capitalized, species is not, okay? Um, primates are arboreal, they live in trees. Primates have mobile limbs um, with five digits, fingers and toes on each hand and foot opposable thumbs, sometimes toes. <clears throat> With nails instead of claws. Um, which allow primates to grasp food and tree limbs. Those claws getting in the way. Um, primates have short snouts and front facing eyes which allow for um, binocular or stereoscopic vision. Binocular. It gives us depth of perception versus being like prey that have their eyes on the side of their heads. Um, primates have larger, more complex brains uh, to process vision. Um, when compared to other animals. Primates have a reduced reproductive rate compared to other animals. Um, and it's thought that this was an evolutionary advantage because it would be hard to move multiple offspring from tree to tree um, back, back in the beginning, okay? Are the primates below prosimians are anthropoids? Um, so there's two different groups here. Um, these guys are anthropoids. And these guys are prosimians. More closely related to the anthropoids. Okay. Sorry. 
There we go. Okay, comparative anatomy. So this is where you take the anatomy between two species that could be considered similar and you compare them. Hence the term comparative anatomy. All right, so compared to a chimp, a human has a spinal cord that exits from the center of the base of the skull um, rather than from the rear or the back of the skull. Come on, Mr. Penn, there you go. Has Okay. So you can't really see it here because of the angle, but if you think about what a human skull looks like, we have the whole, the opening in the, in the base, and that's where our vertebral column and our spinal cord sit, versus again, um, a chimpanzee that's gonna come more from the back and out. Our spine has a gentle S shape, instead of more of just a kind of a C-shaped spine. Um, and again, that's partly because we walk upright all the time. Chimpanzees can walk upright for short amounts of time, but they're not constructed for it. Um, this is also evident in our pelvis or the shape of our hips. Um, our pelvis is broader and bowl-shaped and again, that has to do with weight distribution, the ability to walk and function consistently on um, two legs because we're bipedal. Whereas uh, chimpanzee is going to be more closed in and narrow. Anyway, um, so again, not, not structured, not constructed to walk on two legs constantly. Bipedal structure for by bipedal function. Um, all right, so the femur also has a different uh, orientation. So if you look here at a human femur versus that of a chimpanzee, the human femur points down and medially angles toward the knee, okay, instead of angling outward. It's going to aim straight down for the kneecaps rather than having this um, angle on it. that's part of allowing us to walk upright consistently and then the fact that our femur is placed like this means that we need a stronger knee joint um, and also the fact that we walk on only two legs we need a stronger knee joint because of the weight distribution stronger knee joint. then when it comes to the big toe you can see here and here you kind of can, it's right there. Kind of an odd angle to see it at. But our big toe is fixed. It's not opposable. We can't use it like a thumb. We can't use our feet like our hands. Um, in some cases, people have been able to adapt to utilize their feet with more of that full function. But structurally, our feet are not made to work that way all the time.
Um, and rather than having a flat foot, our feet are arched, which they've kind of tried to show here. Okay. All right. All right. Um, and this is kind of a, it's one of those things when you're looking at structure and function. Our structure fits the function of upright movement consistently. Um, our structure fits the function of not living in trees anymore, um, of not requiring that. So there's, there's a lot of things here that it's believed we evolved as our earliest ancestors left the trees um, to begin living more permanently on land. Oops. Evolutionary relationship between species. All right. So this is called a phylogenetic tree. Or what they're calling an evolutionary tree. It is fine, but you're really going to see it as phylogenetic. So it has these different um, structures to it. And the first thing you have is a node. And a node shows a common ancestor. A node is essentially, let me get, oh, this, these junctions. So it's showing that some of these organisms had a common ancestor, which was that guy right there. And then as it continues to split off, let's split off to right here. Uh, humans and chimpanzees had a common ancestor that was right here. But we can continue to trace that ancestry back to each of these nodes in our evolutionary history. Okay. Then we have the branches. And the branches are showing the lineage to a specific species. Okay. So this is really small for me. Maybe you guys can make it bigger for you. Um, I can, so we've got, again, our human and chimpanzee line. And so these branches that come off from the common ancestor are showing the two distinct species that came from that ancestor. So the common ancestor shown on this node right here gave two branches or two lineages to human and chimpanzees. Okay, molecular clock, time from divergence, meaning the divergence from the common ancestor, the divergence of species, one becoming two or more, um, usually measured through the mutations that can be seen in DNA, assuming that there is DNA evidence that hasn't been degraded enough to look at. Um, Okay, um, mutations occur independently and then randomly after divergence, which is what allows two species to continue to become less and less similar. And I'll explain. So essentially, um, when a species diverges, um, you have 
an event called speciation. And that's where um, two or more new species are made from an original parent species and they can no longer interbreed. So when the human line and the chimpanzee line diverged from each other, they were no longer able to interbreed. And so, you know, different sets of mutations happened in the genes through the processes of natural selection that allowed chimpanzees to eventually look how they look today and humans to look how they look today. And this is true with anything else. I've just happened to pick that particular node and that particular branch because I can see that that's a little picture of a little guy somewhere in there. Okay. Um, but it's the truth for any of these. Humans did not evolve from chimpanzees, but we share a common ancestor, which is clearly seen in this phylogenetic tree. In a minute, when we get to the end of this, I'd like to do um, a little, I was going to say discussion, but you guys aren't here to discuss with me. So I'm going to give a little spiel that I do on evolution usually when we're together. Um, but I'm going to do that. I'll do that at the end of this. So I have some thoughts. I won't share along the way. We'll just make it confusing. Um, okay, so scientific classification. Um, I showed you that. That was the domain, kingdom, phylum, all that, right? Um, it's a ranking of closely related species. So for humans and chimpanzees, I think we follow the same, I think we follow the same, yeah, it's all the way through phylum. I don't know, I'm staring at this one like it's going to answer me. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, I think family is where humans branch off from chimpanzees pretty positive, but we share a lot of that. So the more, the more genetic similarities that you have to another species, the more of those classification systems you're going to share until it branches off at the very end. And again, you're going to do your genus, then species. I talked about Homo sapiens. I wrote it out for you. Usually what you'll see in literature and scientific text, you'll see the genus spelled out once, Homo sapiens, but then the next time the author refers to it, you're gonna get this. So the genus will just be um, abbreviated, just with the first letter, still a capital, and then it'll give you the species. All right, so some of our early ancestors, it's believed, um, come from a line called the Australopithecines, or their genus is Australopithecus. Um, again, early hominins, meaning early human-like forms. Okay, it's believed that they originated in Africa. One of the most famous is called Lucy, if I can spell. Her name is Lucy. And her specific genus species is A. afarensis. So it's Australopithecus afarensis. Um, Lucy was important because it's believed that she, her species was the first to be able to walk consistently on two legs. Um, meaning that they largely made the move from the trees to land as far as their habitat and that their body had taken on the structure of being able to walk upright all the time. Lucy was um, a largely complete skeleton for how hominid fossils are often found. She had part of her skull, she had her rib cage, she had some spine, she had arm and leg bones. But most importantly, as far as evolutionary standpoint is concerned, her pelvis was there, which meant that we could see the angle of her hips and that rather than being that long narrow that we have with modern chimpanzees, hers was curved 
and more open like that bowl, meaning that she walked upright. Um, that we had some uh, indications in her femur um, that let us see that. And so she was considered this, and still it's massive discovery when it comes to watching what's believed to be human evolution, okay? They named her Lucy because the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, was playing when she was unearthed in the 1970s. All right, the Australopithecus genus eventually gave rise to the Homo genus. Um, some of the characteristics of Australopithecines, they had an ape, it's believed that they hadn't had, good gosh, I can talk, had an ape-like brain size and face. Um, their arms were long compared to their leg, you have that longer arm to leg ratio, human-like pelvis and lower leg skeleton because of being able to walk upright. Okay, we're skipping over a couple of genuses here to head straight into Homo. So the Homo genus, we had a few of them, some of which, oh no, okay. So let me, I told you that we're skipping over some. So it's believed at the moment, the earliest hominid skeleton that they have found is something called Sahelanthropus chidensis, which is here. Sahelanthropus being the genus. Then we had another group, another genus called Artipithecus, also very ancient. Then we moved into the Australopithecines, and there was another branch down here called the Paranthropus group. So you have Zeanthropus, Artipithecus, Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and then Homo. We're not going to go over all of those other ones, although, frankly, I think they're very interesting, especially looking at the difference between the Paranthropus and the Australopithecus groups. But we'll go ahead and follow into Homo. So Homo sapiens were characterized by a few things. I don't know why I said Homo sapiens. Homo, the Homo genus was associated with having larger brains. Um, Human-like jaws and teeth. Um, evidence of tool use. This is a big one when it comes to anthropology. And then, of course, they were always bipedal. All right, so evolution kind of encompasses um, a couple of different disciplines. Oops. Yeah, so guys. Um, it encompasses, you know, this branch of evolutionary biology. Um, it includes anthropology, which is a study of kind of ancient human civilizations. Um, it includes um, usually some archaeology. Um, it includes a branch of genetics. Uh, there's more. There's a lot. And then you have your taxonomy, which is human classification, or not human, it's organismal classification and naming systems. It covers a lot of disciplines. And so when I teach evolution, you know, there's also anthropology mixed into it. So when I said the evidence of tool use is big for anthropology, it is because anthropologists are often looking at how human behavior has changed over time. And those behaviors include what type of tools they used, um, what they used for hunting, what they used to cut apart their kill, what they used to make other types of um, tools, hammers, chisels, weapons, things like that. So homo genus is associated with all kinds of different tools. And an anthropology standpoint, there are types of tools that are grouped together based off of era, kind of. 
So anyway, we don't generally go into that much in biology because we're more concerned with the physiological changes and changes in the brain and changes in genetics. But anthropology takes that and then applies it to human behavior, human societies, human rituals, um, things like that. All right, an example of HOMO, there's several of them. This one is gonna go off of HOMO fluorescensis. Um, HOMO fluorescensis is often referred to as the Hobbit people because they were tiny, fully grown. They appeared to be only about three feet tall, right about Hobbit size, okay? And they would have lived about 18,000 years ago which is abbreviated K-Y-A, for a thousand years. Um, diverge from an earlier homogeneous group. Homo erectus was one of the really early ones. So it's thought that maybe erectus gave rise to it. Um, erectus is here, it just means the upright man. Before that, we did have Homo habilis, um, uh, which was the handyman, because lots of tools. Homo aragaster, a little newer. Homo heidelbergensis, and then Homo neanderthalensis. Yes, Neanderthal. I'll get there in a sec. Um, the short stature is believed to be an example of island dwarfism where the genes were um, a higher number of genes for dwarfism existed in the smaller population because they were isolated from the larger population um, because they were on an island. Okay, the Neanderthals. What is this? What is happening right there? I don't even know. Uh, Homo Neanderthalensis. It used to be Neanderthal, but they've decided the H is silent. So it's Neanderthal. It may change again. You know what they do with like Pluto? It's a planet, and then it's not, and then it is, and then it isn't, and then it's not, and then it is. I don't even know. Kind of that type of thing. Very, very common across the sciences as more information is discovered, but it's really common in this area of evolution. I'm actually fascinated with Neanderthal history and evolution, um, perhaps in part because I probably have Neanderthal DNA. Um, I haven't done 23 and me because I think they actually say that, but my ancestry is heavily Norwegian. I know it looks like I should be Irish and I do have some, um, and I have a lot of English, but I'm actually heavily Norwegian, Scandinavian. And so um, a lot of the Neanderthals were considered to be in that area. And uh, not only am I interested in it for that reason, but frankly, the possibility of how they um, kind of went extinct I don't know, it just fascinates me, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Physical um, features, large jaws and a prominent brow ridge. This is an artist's representation of a Neanderthal man. Most of these representations come from actual skulls that have been recovered, and then an artist shapes those skulls. Um, and so this is what they would have come across Obviously, it's like what we would consider a modern man. It does have a rather prominent brow ridge, which you can see right here. But there's plenty of people on the earth today that have that too. It was just more of a characteristic, more of a hallmark characteristic. They're also more muscular than humans. And Neanderthals were heavier. They were stockier. They had a bigger, heavier build. And I mean that not as in weight necessarily, um, but I mean it in like bone structure and girth and things like that. Um, they also had a slightly larger brain than Homo sapiens.
Um, and that was possibly, there's a lot of hypotheses about that, but it might have been because it needed more control over more muscles. Um, Neanderthals, to say they had advanced tools. Well, again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Give me a second. Uh, buried their dead with flowers and tools. In other words, they had evidence of a sophisticated culture. Um, and then they interbred um, with humans. And it's believed at this point today that we have that in the human population today, we have between one and 4% of the population that has, that comes from Neanderthals. Actually, I, I misstated that. One to 4% of our genome, of the human genome comes from Neanderthals. It is believed at this point. So people often think about Neanderthals as being the caveman, okay? And part of that came because of all the evidence of um, their existence that was left behind in caves, although a lot of the, the dating on that has been changed too, to think it was part of other groups. Anyway, um, Fred Flintstone was kind of a representation of the caveman. Uh, it, it, you know, even just a few decades ago, it was believed that they really didn't have a whole lot of intelligence, that they didn't have a written language, that they didn't have um, much of a language, that they were just animalistic, human-looking creatures. That's changed a lot with the more evidence that's been discovered. And again, I just, I've always had this fascination in studying Neanderthals because in all respects, really, they were like homo sapiens and they lived concurrently with homo sapiens, which that's what we are, we're homo sapiens. So we mixed with them because we were like them. There were just a few genetic differences in their body structures and in their brain size. But, you know, to, to think about them as being backwards or not having language, not having you know, the same level of intelligence, it's just, you know, an injustice. It's just not fair because it's not true. It's believed that the Neanderthals died out because they interbred with humans, with Homo sapiens, to the point that they muddied their own gene pool, their own genome enough that we all just became one. There's a lot of other theories um, for what happened to the Neanderthals, including climate change and their body's ability to adapt if they were better suited for the colder climates. But even over the past couple of decades, since I was an undergrad, that has changed because of all of our DNA research, okay? So all of our ability to look into DNA, to take DNA samples, because there's a lot of really good Neanderthal DNA samples that can be found, the more we find that we mixed with them and that they probably in a way, bred themselves out of existence as they mixed more completely with Homo sapiens, um, which is why so much of our genome exists, or so much of our genome consists of Neanderthal DNA. And again, there are some individuals and some populations in the world that have even higher amounts of Neanderthal DNA, um, which I think is fascinating. I just, I love it. So, anywho, let's move on. All right, last page. We've got this last group here we'll talk about. The Denisovans. The, the 
we can uphill. So what were we talking about? We can do this. I can do this. Did this event. Lived in Asia at the same time that the Neanderthals were living in what we would consider Europe today. Um, they interbred with humans also. Southeast Asian groups contain up to 5% DNA from this population. Um, kind of the same thoughts here about what would have happened to them. And by the way, this is newer. This, the understanding of this group is newer um, as far as how they contributed to the evolution of these Southeast Asian populations. That's not something even a couple of decades ago that was really talked about very in depth. Um, but again, it's believed that they were either displaced and if they were displaced, they would have more than likely become extinct um, out of an inability to either adapt to climate or insufficient food resources or like the Neanderthals, they just interbred to the point that they bred themselves out of existence. Okay. Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens originated in Africa. It's believed and migrated out of the area about 100,000 years ago. There's a couple of other theories about it. Um, it's, you know, one theory is like the out of Africa thing that all human ancestry and life originated in Africa and then spread out. Another theory is that it spread out and then evolved. Mm -hmm. Again, more genetic evidence is kind of contributing to more of the out of Africa type theory. A little bit more of an anthropology thing unless you get into the genetics of it. Um, Homo sapiens have high phenotypic, phenotypic variation. In other words, we have a lot of different physical appearances. We have a lot of different phenotypes, right? It's believed that those phenotypes eventually <clears throat> evolved or came into being as humans adapted to the local environments that they were living in. So here they've got a couple of images showing the extreme conditions, extreme different conditions that humans could have lived in. Um, some of us ultra pasty white people, um, you know, harken back to some of the European, Western European countries, England, where you don't necessarily have as much sunlight and you're not, we're not equatorial, we're far above that, so temperatures are a little different. Um, it tends to be that races and populations and cultures and ethnicities that are closer to the equator often have more melanin in their skin because of the increased sunlight. So these are kind of just small adaptations, if you will, to allow that group of homo sapiens to fit comfortably in their specific environment you know, that we can see in the human population as a whole. In the past, and really before travel became so much easier, um, those specific phenotypic differences stayed isolated in certain regions of the world. But then, of course, you know, in more modern times, we've mixed to the point that we all kind of have DNA from everywhere. I mean, my kids are gonna be part Norwegian, part English, part Irish and Scottish. They're gonna be part Portuguese, part Spaniard, part um, Native American. They've got all of it because obviously I mixed with my Mexican husband or had kids with my Mexican husband. And we have very different phenotypes that came from very different regions originally of, of the world. So the more of that that takes place, the more variation a single individual 
will carry in their genes. Make sense? Okay. Um, so kind of, we just talked about this, but we can put this down. So in colder climates, some of the overall averages, phenotypic averages found in populations of colder climates include shorter limbs, larger torso, okay? Um, and this has to do with surface area, basically to conserve heat. If the limbs are shorter, then there's not as much skin for heat to be lost from. Um, hot climate is different. Tend to have longer limbs and kind of a thinner torso. And this increases surface area for more distribution of heat. So that's why they're showing these two, again, opposites, these two extremes and environments. One is obviously in a very warm climate and one is in a um, much colder climate. One body is kind of built to release heat and one body is built to store it. That's how that works. Are humans still evolving? Um, yes, but I think a lot of times people think about evolution as being, you know, hey, but we're all still homo sapiens. We're not homo something else. No, we're not. But within the group of homo sapiens, we have a lot of things that are changing. Lactose intolerance, um, actually in the gene that came about to even let us digest it in the first place. Some populations as a whole almost lack it completely. Um, HIV resistance, that's kind of a malaria sickle cell type thing, which is interesting. Um, then of course, there's just some of the, the basics. Humans are a lot taller than they used to be. Or even just a few centuries ago, we've adapted or so that our height is much, much greater than it once was. Um, there's a list of things. Those are some of the most common and the ones that I'm going to stop at. But um, let me real quick, I want to pull up my whiteboard for just a second. for a minute and this may have been covered in the other lecture to some extent so a couple of things I say maybe repeat this part won't be probably but I'll start with it people often think when it comes to evolution um, first off that we're looking at a straight line between apes and mankind they were an ape and now we're men right but as you saw in that phylogenetic tree it's not a direct path. It's believed instead that there were a series of transitions that gave rise eventually at the very end to man. There was a common ancestor, but even that common ancestor was not an ape, right? So that's wrong. That common ancestor was something else entirely. That common ancestor eventually gave rise to both apes and men, but that's not what they were originally. Um, that's one of the big things that's a problem with people that uh, it's a common misconception. Another is that evolution leads to perfectly adapted individuals, that eventually you'll adapt to the point of perfection, this utopia. That's not how it works because evolution is a product of natural selection and natural selection is a product of whatever's happening in the environment. So, you know, we may be well adapted for a particular environment, but if something massive changed on the earth, it's really, really possible that a lot of humanity wouldn't survive because we wouldn't be adapted to whatever the new change was. And so then there'd have to be a new evolution to take place to allow humans to live. So there is no such thing as leading to a perfect form. Um, evolution can only work on traits that can be inherited. So 
if you have a tattoo, you're not going to have a baby with a tattoo because you made a phenotypic change only. So it has to be in your genes for evolution to work on it. If you dye your hair, your baby's not going to come out with that same dyed hair color. It can only work on the natural hair color that your genes pass on. Um, another thing, individuals don't evolve. Populations do. If you grow wings right now, but you don't reproduce to pass those genes on to offspring, it was pointless because you aren't considered an evolved individual. The population has to change as those genes change within all of the individuals. Next thing about evolution. People often feel stuck between religion and evolution. Okay. Why does it look like I spelled religion wrong, you guys? Can I not spell anymore? I guess I can't, but I didn't because there's an I missing. There, I fixed it. All right, anyway. forever since the theory was really come up with. Um, it's felt like you either had to pick religion as far as creationism is concerned, or you had to pick evolution. The two hypotheses are considered mutually exclusive and that you can't believe in both. It's caused a lot of conflict over the years. Um, I don't view it this way. And so I just pass this on to every class I teach. Some of you may never be concerned with it. You're like, whatever it was, it was, and here we are, right? Others may feel really conflicted. I found both and everything in between in the years I've been teaching this. Um, so for what it's worth, if it's anything at all, I think that this idea of where humans came from specifically can be seen on kind of a continuum, okay? So rather than having to pick either creation or evolution, I think you can fall in between. Um, in other words, I think that you can be a person that believes in a higher being, a higher intelligence that was ultimately responsible for the creation of humans, but evolution played a role in it, right? Maybe there were some things that evolution changed until we look like we do today, or not so much look like we do today, but that we've adapted the way we have to live today. Then there may be some that really think evolution is how this whole thing happened, but maybe that evolution was overseen by a divine intelligence. Okay, and then you can fall right smack in the middle. You can still fall solidly on one side or the other, right? But the point is, I don't think that Evolution and creation need to be mutually exclusive. Um, there aren't a ton of people that feel like this. As a scientist, I have been called not a scientist. Um, I talk about any type of belief that a higher intelligence could have participated um, in the existence of humanity. It's considered supernatural. Um, and then of course, as a, a Christian, there are those that find it almost blasphemous to think that evolution could have played any role in it. So I think that it could be either. And there's a lot of Christian scientists who actually feel the same way. They're just not necessarily the majority. My whole point is, if this is an issue that you're curious about or have been struggling about or have been wondering about, set aside the mutually exclusive thing and just create your belief based off of your experience, your knowledge and your understanding. The point in all of these things to me is that you come up with your own educated opinion about things, whether that's politics, whether it's evolution, whether it's whether you should be vaccinated or not. The point is educate yourself on both sides of the topic before you make your decision. And then if you do that, you always have this firm foundation inside of yourself for what you think, what you believe. And then when things change and everybody's coming up with 
Pluto's a planet. No, it's not, right? You kind of have your own basis on where you stand and why. Um, that's what I think drew me to science in the first place was I, I wanted to know things. And once I started to learn things, even just scratching the surface, because I really feel like that's all any of us do, no matter how many degrees we have, um, as we scratch the surface, we can make better decisions. We can form better opinions and thoughts about things. So that being my overarching belief regarding science and life, that's what I want you to do here. Know both sides, understand both sides as best as you can and make your decision. Um, evolution is often thought of as being, again, this ape to man thing. But really, guys, evolution is change in a population over time. Change in a population over time. Right? When you go at evolution with that definition of mind instead of the one that's often part of our um, social awareness of evolution, it really kind of puts everything into perspective. So, all right, there it is. As always, as I say it all the time, one of my favorite subjects. I just have too many, I have too many favorite parts of biology, but this is certainly, certainly one of them. Because we have seen change in populations over time, even if you're just looking at extinction events. Those have happened. Populations have gone out of existence, right? And that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to take everything about human evolution and believe that the Australopithecines, you know, eventually gave rise to homo genus, who eventually created homo sapiens. It doesn't mean you have to go that far. You can just be like, yeah, change in populations happens. So I believe on some level evolution happens. Whatever you want to do with it, I just am here to attempt to give you the information as clearly as I can. And I have no issue with whatever you choose to believe or not. Yeah, know that. Know that and then go and discover for yourselves. Talk to you soon.